Hello and welcome to this service of poetry and prose, this celebration of the season of Advent and longing and of Christmas. We're going to have, as we always do, many, many services where we hear the Bible stories that are the heart of the Christmas good news. The angels visit to Mary, the birth, shepherds, wise men. But there are many other places where we encounter the wonder of Christmas in novels, poems, songs, some of them serious, some of them deeply profound, some of them delightfully light-hearted. In those also, we meet what it means that Christmas happens. We see how others throughout history have encountered and interpreted the wonder of these days. In this service, members of St Peter's congregation have sent in readings, poems, that they love, that speak to them of Christmas, that remind them of what this is about. We've put those together into a collection and added into it an anthem sung by the choir. We're not putting into it lots of carols and hymns because there'll be other chances to sing and listen to them and it's far more fun to join in with them when we can. This is just a chance to hear what other people in the church think it's all about. There'll be good things in each of them, and I hope you enjoy them. Before we start, let's pray. Great God, we thank you for these Advent days of longing. We thank you for the mystery of the gift of your Son and the different ways you have shown that wonder to the world. Open our hearts to the joy of this season. Open our minds to understand how others see it. Open our imagination to enjoy and share in the wide variety of ways of understanding that you are here, that you have come born as a child and you have made us to long for you and to live with you. In, in the name of Christ, whose birth we celebrate, we pray. Amen. Advent by Christina Rossetti This Advent moon shines cold and clear These Advent nights are long Our lamps have burned year after year And still their flame is strong Watchman, watchman what of the night? We cry, heart sick with hope deferred No speaking signs are in the sky is still the watchman's word. The porter watches at the gate, the servants watch within. The watch is limes and late, the prize is slow to win. Watchman, what of the night? But still his answer sounds the same. No daybreak tops the utmost hill, nor pale are lamps of flame. One to another hear them speak, the patient virgins wise. Surely he is not far to seek. All night we watch and rise. The days are evil looking back, the coming days are dim. Yet count we not his promise slack, slack but watch and wait for him. One with another, soul with soul, they kindle fire from fire. Friends, watch us who have touched the goal. They urge us, come up higher. With them shall rest our way-sore feet. With them is built our home with Christ. They sweet, but he most sweet, sweeter than honeycomb. There no more parting, no more pain, the distant ones brought near, the lost so long are found again, long lost, but longer dear. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, nor heart conceived that rest, with them are good, good things long deferred, with Jesus Christ our best. 
We weep because the night is long. We laugh for day shall rise. We sing a slow contented song and knock at paradise. Weeping, we hold him fast who wept for us. We hold him fast and will not let him go except he bless us first or last. Weeping, we hold him fast tonight. Not let him go till daybreak smite our wearied sight and summer smite the snow. Then figs shall bud and dove with dove shall coo the livelong day. Then he shall say, Arise, my love, my fair one, come away. Christmas by John Betjeman The bells of waiting advent ring, the torture stove is lit again, and lamp oil light across the night has caught the streaks of winter rain. In many a stained glass window sheen, from crimson lake to hooker's green. The holly in the windy hedge, and round the manor house the yew, will soon be stripped to deck the ledge, the altar font and arch and pew, so that the villagers can say, the church looks nice on Christmas Day. Provincial public houses blaze and corporation tramcars clang, on lighted tenements I gaze where paper decorations hang, and bunting in the red town hall says, Merry Christmas to you all. And London shops on Christmas Eve are strung with silver bells and flowers as hurry and clerks the city leave to pigeon-haunted classic towers, and marble clouds go scudding by the many-steepled London sky. And girls in slacks remember Dad, and oafish louts remember Mum, and sleepless children's hearts are glad, and Christmas morning bells say come, even to shining ones who dwell safe in the Dorchester Hotel. And is it true, and is it true this most tremendous tale of all, seen in a stained glass window's hue, a baby in an ox's stall, the maker of the stars and sea, become a child on earth for me. And is it true, for if it is no loving fingers tying strings around those tissued fripperies, the sweet and silly Christmas things, bath salts and inexpensive scent, and hideous tie so kindly meant, no love that in a family dwells, no caroling in frosty air, nor all the steeple-shaking bells can with this single truth compare, that God was man in Palestine and lives today in bread and wine. The Cratchit's Christmas dinner. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought the goose the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon to which a black swan was a matter of course, and in truth it was something very like it in that house. Mrs Cratchit made the gravy, ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigour. Miss Belinda sweetened up the apple sauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody not forgetting themselves and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it into the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all round the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. 
Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavour, size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by apple sauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs Cratchit had said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate it all at last. Yet everyone had had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall of the backyard and stolen it while they were merry with the goose. A supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello, a great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like a washing day. That was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next door to each other, with a laundress's next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs Cratchit entered, flushed, but smiling proudly with the pudding, like a speckled cannonball, so hard and firm, blazing in half of half a quartern of ignited brandy and bedight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, a wonderful pudding, Bob Cratchit said, and calmly too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind, she would confess she had had her doubts about the quantity of flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody thought or said it was at all a small pudding for a large family. It would have been flat heresy to do so. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. At last the dinner was all done, the cloth was cleared, the hearth swept and the fire made up. The compound in the jug being tasted and considered perfect, tipples and oranges were put upon the table and a shovel full of chestnuts on the fire. Then all the Cratchit family drew round the hearth in what Bob Cratchit called a circle, meaning half a one, and at Bob Cratchit's elbow stood the family display of glass, two tumblers and a custard cup without a handle. These held the hot stuff from the jug, however, as well as golden goblets would have done, and Bob served it out with beaming looks while the chestnuts on the fire sputtered and cracked noisily. Then Bob proposed, A Merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us all, which all the family re-echoed. God bless us, everyone, said Tiny Tim, the last of all. The Coming by R. S. Thomas and God held in his hands a small globe. Look, he said. The sun looked. Far off, as through water, he saw a scorched land of fierce colour. The light burned there. Crusted buildings cast their shadows. A bright serpent, a river uncoiled itself, radiant with slime. On a bare hill, a bare tree saddened the sky. Many people held out their thin arms to it, as though waiting for a vanished April to return its crossed boughs. The sun watched them. Let me go there, he said. This is the long night. It will snow and it will drift. White snow there will be till day. 
white moon they will be till morn. This is the night of the great nativity. This night is born Mary, the Virgin's son. This night is born Jesus, son of the King of glory. This night is born to us, the root of our joy. This night gleamed the sun of the mountains high. This night gleamed sea and shore together. This night was born Christ, the King of greatness. Ere it was heard that the glory was come, heard was the wave upon the strand. Ere it was heard that his foot had reached the earth, heard was the song of the angels glorious. This night is the long night. Glowed to him wood and tree, glowed to him mount and sea, glowed to him land and plain, when that his foot was come to earth. King John's Christmas. King John was not a good man. He had his little ways and sometimes no one spoke to him for days and days and days. And men who came across him when walking in the town gave him a supercilious stare or passed with noses in the air and bad King John stood dumbly there blushing beneath his crown. King John was not a good man, 
and no good friends had he. He stayed in every afternoon and no one came to tea. And round about December, the cards upon his shelf, which wished him lots of Christmas cheer and fortune in the coming year, were never from his near and dear, but only from himself. King John was not a good man, yet had his hopes and fears. They'd given him no presents now for years and years and years. But every year at Christmas, while minstrels stood about, collecting tribute from the young for all the songs they might have sung, he stole away upstairs and hung a hopeful stocking out. King John was not a good man, he lived his life aloof. Alone he thought a message out while climbing up the roof. He wrote it down and popped it against the chimney stack. To all and sundry, near and far, F Christmas in particular, and signed it not Johannes Rex, but very humbly Jack. I want some crackers and I want some candy. I think a box of chocolates would come in handy. I don't mind oranges, I do like nuts, and I should like a pocket knife that really cuts. And oh, Father Christmas, if you love me at all, bring me a big red India rubber ball. King John was not a good man, he wrote this message out, and got him to his room again, descending by the spout. And all that night he lay there, a prey to hopes and fears. I think that's him a-coming now. Anxiety bedewed his brow. He'll bring one present anyhow, the first I've had for years. Forget about the crackers and forget the candy. I'm sure a box of chocolates would never come in handy. I don't like oranges, I don't want nuts, and I have got a pocket knife that almost cuts. But oh, Father Christmas, if you love me at all, bring me a big red India rubber ball. King John was not a good man. Next morning, when the sun rose up to tell a waiting world that Christmas had begun, and people seized their stockings and opened them with glee, and crackers, toys and games appeared, and lips with sticky sweets were smeared, King John said grimly, as I feared, nothing again for me. I did want crackers and I did want candy. I know a box of chocolates would come in handy. I do love oranges. I did want nuts. And oh, if Father Christmas had loved me at all, he would have brought me a big red India rubber ball. King John stood by the window and frowned to see below the happy bands of boys and girls all playing in the snow. A while he stood there watching and envying them all, when through the window, big and red, they hurtled by his royal head and bounced and fell upon the bed, an India rubber ball! And oh, Father Christmas, my blessings on you fall for bringing him a big red India rubber ball. Thank you. To all those who chose poems and readings, who recorded them or sent them in, thank you also and especially to Faye, who wonderfully collated these and put them together, brought the recordings together, read those that had been submitted on paper rather than as a computer, and checked the copyright information and got permission for us to put, have this service available to you. We've joined together, I hope, wherever you are, in the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. May the wonders 
of the coming season of Christmas be yours. May they lighten your heart and spread joy in your life as we celebrate the gift of light in the darkness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christmas Greetings by Lewis Carroll Lady dear, if fairies may for a moment lay aside cunning tricks and elvish play, tis a happy Christmas tide. We have heard the children say, gentle children whom we love, long ago on Christmas Day came a message from above. Still, as Christmas tide comes round, they remember it again. Echo still the joyful sound, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Yet the hearts must childlike be where such heavenly guests abide, until children, in their glee, all year is Christmas tide. Thus forgetting tricks and play for a moment, lady dear, we would wish you, if we may, Merry Christmas, Glad New Year. <laughs> 